yourself and then share a question. Sure. So first thanks for the speakers for tonight's excellent speech. It's very eye-opening. So my name is Chen Shi. I just graduated from the University of Oxford with an MBA degree. And currently I'm running two startups. One is in fashion, and the other is uh, blockchain related. Amazing. Which actually <laughs> correspond to today's topic because some of you are from the technology background and some of you are from the fashion. But specifically, I have a question for Sadie. Is that how your name yeah. is pronounced? But I think it's more broader to every one of you because I want to know technology and fashion, they're somewhat buzzword for business. But I want to know what's the ultimate motivation behind this. For example, taking Sadie, for example, you did this amazing uh, metal artwork and later on you integrate it with technology. It's fabulous, but I want to know what's the motivation for you to start this in the beginning. Because running two startups, I'm also reflect on, I want to go beyond the buzzword. I want to do more substantial things. And so I really want to learn about your motivation. What fascinates you most about this? So I think the question um, was, what's the motivation that dr is driving your current project? So should we start with you, Sadie? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Good question. So I know what you mean, like um, technology and fashion, like everyone's on it, everybody wants to know about it. And actually I'm currently doing a project with this amazing company called Zinc Group that I met at the Wearable Tech Show. And um, we are creating a product, uh, I don't want to give too much away because I've signed an NDA and all of that, but it's about enhancing people's lives. So it's still you know, kind of in correlation with blockchain and cryptocurrency and what, you know, what that does. But it's about an aesthetic, it's about a product, and it's about you know, something that people can wear as opposed to just have on your iPhone or on your iPad. So I guess that's why it's quite motivational for people to get involved in it. Um, I didn't touch on wearable tech, maybe I should have done. That is obviously the most popular, and that doesn't really interest me. Like, I think you know, this whole idea of you know, smart textiles or, you know, um, I know people that have created a bikini that tracks your sun rays so you, you know, you're alerted when to put more sun cream on. Fine, but who's going to pay 200 quid for that? Like, I know when my body's getting hot, like I can just get, I can put more sun cream on. Um, so, no, but it's true. So I just think, you know, there are boundaries, there are limits, and I think you've got to be clever with it. And I think for me, I don't know enough about tech and I find it super intriguing, which is why I don't have that. Um, kind of generic way of approaching fashion and tech. I, I'm, I'm not really interested in the wearables. I'm more about how I can communicate an idea um, through art and technology to an audience that doesn't really understand either, if that makes sense. Has that answered your question? Or oh, part of it, because I'll pass it over. <laughs> Do you want to answer something? Yeah. yeah, so for me, my inspiration was around, like I said, at first it was a little bit selfish in that I just want to reduce the cost. I didn't want to uh, spend so much money to send money. Um, but then once I understood the problem and I started doing research, I realized that this was people being unbanked and people being um, trapped in poverty because of cash is, is, is such, a big, such a big thing and technology can solve that. So, you know, there's over two billion people that are unbanked and, you know, without identity, so it's, it, it, that was my passion, or that grew into my passion later. Um, mine was because I have quite a strong anti-authoritarian streak, <laughs> and um, I don't like the way that governments control people around the world by um, using financial weapons, and um, I think you only have to look at the law that looks like it's going through the EU Parliament today, Article 13, which is really strong censorship essentially um, wrapped up as something that's beneficial for copyright holders so this idea of being able to run software that is censorship proof because it runs on it can run on any computer in the world and cannot be shut down essentially cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin cannot be shut down by governments the and wanting to know more about this 
and how I could become part of this movement um, was the thing that really interested me. And just also the idea that such things are even possible in this world. It's like magic. Okay, more Thanks. questions. Hello. Hi, my name is Rima Patel. Um, I'm a management consultant and I'm an executive MBA student at Imperial. My question is actually about smart cities because I'm writing a paper on it, so hopefully you can answer the question for me. <laughs> okay, so, That's clever. Um, uh, my paper is on the mobilisation plan for smart cities, and I'm really looking at both of you because it's to do with the business fashion operator models. And what I'm really trying to answer is, in the next like five to 50 years, what is the expectations from our CTOs and our CIOs within large businesses like Gucci or um, Burberry? And what partnerships should we be looking for? Now, I don't expect you to predict the future, but you're already working within technology that's going to be used even more in the future. So if you had any advice, what would be the top three things that you would say to a CTO about partnerships and what expect expectations or capabilities within organizations would you advise them on as well? Okay, so just to break down that question, um, so it's looking at what advice would you give CTOs looking towards creating a better future in partnerships and leveraging technology within their company and you know what should they be thinking about? So maybe we'll start over with you, Ria. Okay, so um, there are various ways in which um, company, which fashion companies are, I mean, we can talk a lot about general smart cities and using um, blockchains to supply trusted data in sensors and things like that. But um, from a purely fashion point of view, I can think of um, three ways which blockchain tech is already helping with logistics and so on. So one of them is fighting against counterfeit goods. That's a really important thing, obviously, from fashion companies' point of view. Um, another one, um, there is a company in London um, called Provenance and others which do similar things, startups around the world, which um, look at the origin of products and use blockchain tech to prove that those products are sustainable. And a third potential way, although the um, problems of scalability with blockchains are kind of inhibiting this at the moment, is the use, um, you touched on the idea of sensors in clothing and mm. smart clothing, ultimately being able to track clothing um, through sensors and so on. And obviously that takes us into kind of some kind of scary dystopian thing where mm. people get trapped and so on but it's not hard to imagine that that might happen. Can I just ask a follow-up question? I think, I think, I think all, all three things that you just said are excellent. Um, would you advise a CTO to have partnerships with companies that are already really good at blockchain and sourcing materials, okay. just as you said? Maybe we can ask Giselle um, okay. about that one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so Giselle, do you have any, because um, particularly you work in in developing countries, I'm sure you've had a lot of experience of partnerships and working with different people. Um, and maybe from a first hand experience, maybe you'd like to share some light on what it's like to have partnerships. Yeah. So, first of all, I think my advice was even more broad than it's much, it's, it, re it reaches far beyond partnerships. It's make sure your CTO understands the need and understands what, they're, what they need to build. Um, it sounds pretty obvious that if you're going to build something, you know what you need to build and who you need to build it for. Um, but we've seen lots of startups um, out there building stuff where there just isn't really a market. So understand who you're building for and, and just understand how they're going to be using the product. Um, in terms of partnerships, it always makes, so for me, because blockchain as a technology is quite new, um, crypto is also quite new, um, when you think in developing world, when you, when you say blockchain, people immediately hear Bitcoin, and then they immediately associate that with scam. And then, um, so we try to limit um, our mention of blockchain. We think developing a solution that uh, addresses the need 
we don't necessarily need to say what technology is used. We don't know what Visa, MasterCard uses. I mean, anyone in payments do. But we don't know how a lot of very complicated things work. You don't understand how Facebook works. But you know that you, know, you can post your updates, you can post your pictures, and you can post your status. So it's, it's, but when it comes to developing countries as well, I think it makes sense to partner to some extent with incumbents for what we're doing. Um, in terms of fashion, I can't speak for fashion because I haven't done anything within the fashion space. Um, but in the fintech world, we, we think a partnership is a good model to start, and later on you could go off branch up on your own. So I think maybe we'll direct this to Sadie in ways of, have you worked with any CTOs yourself? Have you got any experience of that? No, actually I haven't. But I think, you know, just jumping on the back of what um, Rian said, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, counterfeit products, like it's so huge right now, like so many, you know, everyone loves Supreme, everybody loves Off-White, you know, there's so many of these um, streetwear brands that people want to get their hands, um, you know, hands on. And I think, you know, um, through this idea of chips and tracking and, you know, I, I've actually got a friend, I don't want to name names, that's in the industry and she's working with a tech company that's creating these little chips in um, every garment so that when the person buys the product, you scan the chip, you know where it's made, you know what material, it's, it's super transparent. So it goes back to the, tr to the sustainability aspect that transparency, that kind of, you know, help in the environment. Um, so yeah, like I'm kind of backing what Rianne said, yeah, if that yeah. answers. <laughs> Is there any more questions from the audience? I think we'll go to the gentleman, like, we'll come from forwards. Thank you. Uh, hi there, uh, it's mainly in British British Island, um, but um, so my name is John Chan. Um, I'm actually a blockchain engineer myself. Um, so I moved into uh, blockchain around the beginning of this year after from FinTech, but I'm actually quite passionate about uh, banking the unbanked myself. Um, it's uh, what I, uh, I keep myself up to date with. Um, I was just wondering if you uh, have a, any motives to move into different countries, such as Venezuela, who are suffering from economic, extreme inflation of their currency. Um, and just because um, I don't think the majority of people understand the true power of cryptocurrencies and how they they, they are actually saving lives. Just a quick example on Venezuela, the minimum uh, the, or the uh, minimum salary per month is about a dollar fifty, and that is not enough to live or survive. And uh, one of the true powers of this country is where some people actually donated about two dollars in the Reddit in a Reddit thread um, to, to their address, and they were to, they were able to exchange that cryptocurrency, whether it be Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, into actual cash and actually provide food for other families, but actually 40 different families themselves. And so, I think, John, with regards to your question, is your question for Giselle based on her views of how cryptocurrency might be affected in Venezuela specifically? Well, her plans on expanding her horizons okay. to different countries. Lovely. So, Giselle, could you give us some examples of how you're planning to expand what you're doing in other <laughs> countries? So, um, sure. We don't operate in Venezuela, by the way. <laughs> Actually, uh, we haven't. We're going to be launching early Q1 next year. Um, so, I'm very cautious when it comes to pitching cryptocurrencies um, to developing parts of the world. Um, there are many use cases where it can be impactful. So, if your your local currency has, um, it's it's highly the word has escaped me, but if, if the value just, you know, you require a wheelbarrow to buy a loaf of bread, um, then yeah, maybe you use cryptocurrencies and in much, it, it holds the value a lot better or the value that you may, the, the risk is much lower. Um, however, using uh, currencies such as uh, Bitcoins in other markets can be, I think, a lot worse for the people um, that you're trying to help. Um, the reason why I say this is it's, there's such volatility in the market that um, if you get so, so there is there are poor people that cannot really afford much, and there are people that have a little bit more and they can afford to lose a little. Um, I think pitching cryptocurrency to those that are really, really, really poor um, could be potentially disastrous. 
um, in that if they were to convert all their fiat into crypto then and the market fluctuates there's no ba there's nothing protecting them and they can lose everything um, so I think we should be very careful when we when we do that um, and I think uh, using it in Venezuela is a good is a good example and other markets where there are uh, the, the currencies it's so highly inflated that you know it, you know within two days you require a lot more money to buy a loaf of bread then that's 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 fine uh, but I, I just think we should be very careful when we think about the use cases for the dirt poor. Thank you for that. And I have this strange feeling that Rianne might have some views on this one as well. So Rianne, would you like to share with us your views on expanding cryptocurrency to, to other developing countries? You just know I have an I, opinion on yes. this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I've actually, I don't think Natalie knows this. I've been working um, with uh, a company which partners with local saving circles in Kenya. Um, and that is not using cryptocurrency. It's um, using a variation on blockchain technology called a light chain to keep the records of saving circles which are currently kept. Um, table banking tends to be um, either paper and pen or people paying big account larger accountancy firms to do this. So this um, startup, Chama Pesa, um, is interestingly using technology, using blockchain tech to um, I wouldn't say help people. Um, the impression I've very much got from talking to um, there's this amazing guy who you need to check out on Twitter called Michael Kimani, who blogs as Kianeki, and he is um, a real authority not just on crypto and blockchain tech in Africa, but also um, on the whole subject of mobile payments and um, people using companies like M-Pesa to operate independently of the banks. And he's quite cynical about the idea of banking the unbanked. He makes the point that a lot of the people who join these savings circles in countries like Kenya, many of them will have a bank account, but they find that for certain services, the saving circles enable them to operate more independently and it gives them more choice. So he makes the point that a lot of people actually are banked, but allowing people to operate independently is a good thing. And if blockchain technology and related technologies like the ones that Chama Pesa are developing can help them do that, then that's of course a good thing. I'm so glad I asked you that question. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. I knew there was something there. So, we want to go to this lady who just, just to... So, if you introduce yourself first and then. Hi, let me I'm your question. Joe Philbin. I'm CFO of a blockchain startup called Globecap. Okay. Um, my question is more on the entrepreneurial side. So, we are just picking up on your point. You were saying that uh, blockchain technology is similar to where the internet was 25 years ago. Um, in light of that, the fact that not that many people understand it right now, as entrepreneurs, what are the challenges that you've faced in building your product um, and attracting people to it? Um, and what words of wisdom would you share with the best of us in how to overcome those? Giselle, because she has a startup. I'd like to chime in a little bit on this. One. So I think for me, um, so the decision to use blockchain, we, you use, we're only using blockchain for remittance. Uh, we're not using uh, blockchain all over the system. Um, we specifically designed it that way because um, of the markets that we're going to go into. Like I say, um, using crypto, um, there are issues around um, transaction, the amount of transactions, the, the speed of transactions, all of that, that is not yet fully fledged out in the, the technology can't yet uh, account for um, a massive amount of transactions the way Visa and MasterCard can. Um, and also I think when we, when we decided 
to design the solution, I didn't want to make the technology that we're building on the focal point. I wanted the need to be the focal point. I wanted to make sure we solve for the need. And I think for us, um, it's not necessary for us to, to be you know, focusing on the blockchain part. Making the remittance cheaper, that's great. So people will be able to uh, get cheaper remittances. But the rest, we're using just normal distributed um, systems. Yeah, so I, mean, I haven't had that much of a chance to let you guys know a little bit about my background, but um, I'm the Communications and Marketing Director for Medical Chain, um, and I was with was their first full-time employee. Um, and from my experience, it's about the why. Why are you doing what you're doing? And how can you give that message to your whole entire audience? I mean, let's face it, most people don't know how the internet works. They do know that they can speak to someone within seconds. They do know that they can search for their, their favorite thing, a funny video. That's why we use those things. So if you have a company that has a strong why behind it, and you can find the right words to communicate that with your segmented market, then they're going to get on board with you. And it doesn't matter what technology is running behind that. Great, if blockchain makes it better, if it makes it more equitable, if there's ways of improving transactions, and getting more people around the globe and both great. Um, but yeah, for me it's about the why. Um, I'm an engineer, not an entrepreneur, so I'm going to sit this question out. I think probably people, um, one problem that I know people have, because I do work with quite a lot of startups, is just managing expectations around what the technology can currently do and what it will probably be able to do in two to three years. I think that's a universal thing for anyone working in this field. It it goes for startups and it also goes for teams working within large corporations whose less technical management expect miracles tomorrow. You know, um, but as I said, it's more of a question for Shizar <laughs> than that. I was going to say that might be an interesting conversation to have sometime about the vision versus the reality. Um, yes. Yeah, because I think there is there is a lot of differences between what um, directors think they're going to be able to achieve within the next six months to a year to actually what development teams can produce, particularly if they don't have the resources and the staff that they need. So is there any other questions from the audience at all? Okay, oh, okay, we've got one more. No, don't be afraid. Um, hi, my name is Irina. I work in finance. Um, and my question is for yourself. Um, I'm quite interested in, um, well, because I come from a developing country and no one where I'm from like trusts banks or use their bank accounts yeah. except for getting paid their salary and taking it out Take five it minutes out. after they get it <laughs> and keep it in their house. So I find it quite interesting that that's kind of the field that you went into. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the main problems, corruption and things like the governance and like mentality that it seems impossible to change. How do you cope with with that, with those barriers of first introducing new technologies, uh, convincing people, or like the barriers that stop you from, from achieving that? So I'm just going to repeat it for the sake of the camera. The, the question that I think you're asking is related to the adoption. What do you feel are the barriers to the adoption from both a political level and from a ground level? Hmm. So, uh, yes, so this is, <laughs> I've actually have a picture of people lining up to take out the, the, all the money from the bank um, the day they get paid in. Uh, it's hilarious when I put it on slides, um, just a massive queue that wraps around the bank. Um, it's really hard to even think about in this country. Um, but, yeah, partnerships. So, yeah, a lot of people don't, do not understand the technology. It's, um, a lot of people even in the developed world don't understand technology and its uh, potential benefits and drawbacks. Um, and the way I tackle that is to um, find partnerships and also help with the educational element. Um, so talking to them about um, different use cases um, that we've seen across the globe that is working or 
um, different possibility based on research. Um, so education, but also partnerships, not um, necessarily deciding to tell the, the, the well, because we're talking about small states, I'm from a tiny island of 110,000 people. There's like, if you want to, you cannot go in there and say that you're going to disrupt the bank. There's like, <laughs> there's like two banks or three banks. It's just like, you're going to be plummeted. So um, my approach is more partnerships. You go and you, you ask the partner, how can I make your processes more efficient? How can I help you reduce operational costs? How can I help you, um, you know, tackle uh, the problems? So a lot of a lot of banks, a lot of reasons why people are unbanked, a lot of people don't know. It's not necessarily that because they can't afford a bank account. It's things like they may live in the rural areas and the banks are, live, are situated in the city. Or it could be that the KYC process is not adapted to the country. So it might be just like the UK where you require utility and, you know, pay slips like three months, but then you're in a seasonal job, so which means that it's, you're only going to be employed for like five months a year, and then maybe the time that you decide to get a bank account, might, you might be beyond that job, so you can't prove the last three months pay, or you simply live at home with your parents, so you, your name is not on the utility bill. Uh, then KYC all falls apart. I mean, KYC falls apart here anyway, with the utility bills, but <laughs> I mean, nobody seemed to be taking that on. Um, so I think <laughs> it's all... It's all around your approach and, uh, and not sure we want to disrupt um, the market. We want to provide better solutions for our clients, uh, for the customers, for merchants. We want to make it cheaper for them. We want to make it more efficient for them. We want people to be better able to spend and save their money. And we want the people that um, may not have been registered at birth um, to get access to their digital ID so that they could continue their lives. Or maybe they were registered at birth, but because there's a massive hurricane that destroyed the records, they can't, they can't prove who they are. Um, we want to help, and technology is a massive, it can help a lot. And uh, it's all around framing that story um, in a way that doesn't threaten anyone. Good answer. Now, just to finish <laughs> off, I have uh, just one question for myself. Um, I would like to know from all of you, if you were to be able to give everybody in this room a little bit of advice, something that you would have been able to tell your former self 10 years ago, what would you tell yourself? That's hard. <laughs> start with someone else. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, I guess a lot of people ask that question, it's quite hard to think, oh my God, what? I guess it's that, that question of, what should I know now, which I knew I knew back then? And I guess it's about authenticity, uniqueness. Obviously, I'm speaking from like an art and design creative perspective. Um, you know, especially in my world, like what, what product have I got that make people intrigued, that make people want to know more? You know, why do I keep getting these commissions? You know, why am I, why are these like huge tech companies wanting to work with me? Like, you know, like who am I, a little old Sadie Clayton? But it's the fact that I've got a unique message and a unique product and I guess um, from a, a creative industry perspective, I'm doing something that not a lot of others are. Um, or if they are, they're people like Burberry and people like Gucci that can because they've got billions of pounds. Um, you know, so I guess that would be my advice. Like just stay true to yourself and just keep producing, a, you know, create a, a unique product or a unique message or... You know, whether it be culturally or, you know, health related or society, wherever it may be, um, just keep plugging, you know, a unique and authentic message. Yeah, that would be my advice. My advice to myself. Uh, mind more coins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> yeah. It was like, yeah, at first I got, I, when I started hearing about bitcoins, it was just like, you know, developer forums. And I thought, there's no way this is going to go anywhere. Um, yeah, my friends are billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> Mine more coins and just keep going. I love that advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ten years ago. Mine's not blockchain or crypto related. Um, it's more general life advice. It's um, be curious and remember that you always regret the things that you don't do, not the things that you do. It's a really, it's a cliche, but it's actually really true. Thank you for that, ladies, and I think that was an excellent note to finish on. So if everyone give our speakers a round of applause.
welcome. <laughs> Thank you.